great to see we've got a good crowd and we're almost at the 400 mark which we were yeah expecting around this number which is fantastic it's a it's a great topic and good to good to have a good crowd who are interested in it great so once again thanks everyone for joining um, as you all would know, the Cyber Crimes Act has finally been signed into law. And what that means is that we actually have a comprehensive law in South Africa that tackles cyber crimes and related issues. So for us, we think that this is great news and it's been a long time coming since it was first uh, introduced as a bill in 2015. So we definitely do believe that we need this kind of law, but it really begs the question, what is the actual effect that the bill, uh, sorry, the act, sorry, I'm so used to calling it a bill, it's been so long. Um, but what is the actual effect that the act has on us as a person and within our organization? So really that is what we're going to unpack and look at from a practical perspective today. So our distinguished panel will really unpack those key issues from various different perspectives so that you can understand how the bill, how the act applies to you. So. Just to let everyone know, this webinar really isn't focused on looking at the history of the act. It really is all about you today and understanding how we can help you. So today with us, we have our managing attorney, John Giles. We have two of our attorneys, uh, Nathan Ross Adams and Bronwyn Seeger. And you have me, Lisa Imaiwalha, who will be your host for this panel. So thanks very much for sending uh, questions. We received quite a few questions before this session. So please feel free to pop those questions that you might have into the chat, and we will try and address them at the end of the session. Um, just as a key thing, please just make sure that the questions are really linked to the topics that we'll be discussing today. And with that introduction, let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is really understand who we're talking to, who you are, so what I'm going to do right now is run a quick poll just to um, understand who you are. So just try and choose the option that uh, suits you the best. Yeah, I think while, that, while you're answering that poll, <clears throat> it's, um, it's a law that has a different impact on different organizations. And, and that's why it's really, uh, again, really useful to understand who you are so that we can explain the impact on different types of organizations, almost put you in different buckets because it's, it's very different for different organizations, extremely different, um, even more so than data protection, I would say. That's so true, John. And I'm going to end the poll and then just launch the results. So as expected, most of you are from a private organization. So we definitely expected that. We do have some financial institutions. Um, very few um, ECSPs or electronic communication service providers. Um, quite a few ICT companies as well. Not so many public bodies, but we do have some represented here today. Of course, we do have individuals and a small percentage of parents. So really we have a lot of private organizations, but we did anticipate that. It's, it's, um, it's unfortunate and a bit alarming that there's no one here from law enforcement. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah but, uh, but that's interesting. Right. So now that we have a general idea of who you are, Let's really look at, as John mentioned, look at the practical impact from different buckets. So the first uh, bucket we're going to look at is private institutions, especially since most of you are from a private organization, private institution. So one of the first things that people really think about when it comes to cyber crimes is that it creates many new offenses. And it really is all about criminalizing the unlawful acts done to computers, for example, networks and data. And also just looking at it from a perspective of unlawful acts that are done using computers and other tools. So let's actually look at data specifically and personal data, in fact. Um, I just want to know, John, will I get into trouble if I don't protect my data in terms of Poppy? Yes, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, and, and um, I think to 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 go a little bit back in history i know that's not the intention but i think you know the the impact is 
many of you, I think, are asking yourselves, well, is there a possibility that my organization could commit a crime and therefore go to jail? And what are those crimes? And, and what do I need to do to make sure we don't commit those crimes? So the, the Cyber Crimes Bill is going to be very useful in helping you to take action against criminals, which is fantastic. It's we, we need that in South Africa. We want a law that criminalizes certain things so that we can catch and put the hackers in jail. We, we need that, definitely need that. Um, I very much believe in the rule of law, and it's very important that we, we create the law and the mechanisms to catch criminals. Uh, very important. But I think that we, we, we want to make sure as well that, that you potentially don't get uh, turned into a criminal by what the law says. And if we look at previous versions, they were poorly drafted in that the, the net was very broad of what crimes were, which, which really had a very negative impact. And I think maybe, Lisa, if I can share my screen and show a few slides to illustrate this issue and just talk through it a little bit about the scope of, of the law. And really, uh, hopefully this will help explain why the law that's been enacted is a lot better than the drafts that came before it, the bills that came before it. So let me share my screen here. And this is our, our overall presentation on, on cybercrime. I'm gonna drill down into the crime specifically and look at the scope. And so what I try to show in this slide is that we live in a free country in South Africa and most countries are free. You're free to, to do what you want, to, to conduct yourself in many different ways. And that's the default position and should be the default position, but it can't go unchecked. And so we need to create a balance and we need to create some control. And the way you do that is through introducing laws and crimes. So the green circle is, is lawful conduct, conduct that is allowed by law, things you can do. The orange circle is then conduct prohibited by law, which could be common law, it could be statutes, and that's unlawful. So if you, you, your conduct is contrary to the law, it's unlawful. Now that's different from criminal conduct. And that's the, the third circle, the red circle, where some unlawful conduct is a crime or an offense and it's therefore illegal. And then the green circle again in that circle is that some people, your conduct might be criminal, but you might have a valid defense like it's in the public interest or that you were authorized. There, there are various other examples of defenses or self-defense, for example. So you have these different scenarios and a lot of people don't appreciate that there's a difference between unlawful and criminal, unlawful and illegal. And, and there's a big difference. So to give you an example, the data protection law generally gives us the conditions or the principle for the lawful processing of personal information. So that's, that's an unlawful context. It's not a criminal context. And generally speaking, data protection laws are decriminalized. There, there are, are very few crimes in them, but the conduct can be unlawful. So the Cyber Crimes Act is all about criminal conduct. It's this red circle down here. That's what we're trying to aim to, to catch. And so it should be quite limited conduct that's criminal. Only very severe things should be criminal. It shouldn't be lots of things. And so really the, the concern is that we end up with a scenario like this where a lot of conduct is criminal and only a little bit is lawful. And therefore this would make us all criminals and it would really restrict what people are able to do. And, and it would also make people prove that they are innocent is another danger that that we want. We don't want a reverse onus or someone to be assumed guilty until proven innocent. So really the, the solution is, is what I've been talking about here, where we have a small number of things that are criminal. And one of our, our big concerns with the earlier draft was that it almost criminalized any unlawful conduct. So that would mean that any unlawful processing of personal data would be criminal. 
But that issue has largely been solved by the wording in the act. And, and maybe I'll actually take you quickly to the wording of the act itself and show you what was included. So it's this wording over here. And let me make that a bit bigger for you so you can see it. So essentially, the law said that for the purposes of certain sections, if uh, a responsible party fails to comply with various sections of POPIA, then they must be dealt with under POPIA and not this law, which was exactly what they then did was to, to decriminalize POPIA, which is a good thing. It's exactly what we were arguing for and what they've done. So that's, that's really good news. Um, I think my, my concern though with the, the act is that there's still various sections that are very broadly phrased and I'm concerned that they still make most of us criminals and, and that's really what I wanted to talk about next. But let me check in with you, Lisa, quickly. Are you happy for me to continue into some examples of the crimes or, or what would you like to, to do? Yes, please, John. Uh, I think go into more examples and then we can just discuss amongst ourselves how we feel about what you've said. Perfect. John, just, just if, before you go ahead, um, it, could you just maybe make a distinction between um, criminal and lawful to the extent that uh, unlawful doesn't mean that there are no legal consequences. There are civil consequences that, that may take place, such as fines or um, the ability of someone who's harmed to, to sue someone in court. But um, having both a crime and uh, having both the behaviors marked as a crime may open um, organizations and people up to, to, to double liability if, if it's interpreted in that way. Yes, exactly. Yep. No, I, I agree with you. And I think that the other related point to that is um, that a lot of people say, well, does the Cyber Crimes Act mean I'm going to have to go and do a whole program and do a whole bunch of work, much like I've done for data protection? And really, the answer is no. There, there's still many things that you should do and that you should be thinking about, but it's a lot less of a compliance requirement than something like Popier. So that's the good news. It really, it's, 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 there's work to be done and there are things to, to check, especially like trying to make sure that your organization and your employees aren't committing crimes. But it's, it's generally, it's not nearly a bigger job as something like a data protection law. That's a good point, John, because a lot of the times, I think when there's a new law, people get a little frantic and we start thinking it's exactly like Poppy. We all, I'm sure, have Poppy fatigue and compliance fatigue, but we really need to change our perspective when it comes to this law because it is a criminal law, as you mentioned. It's not really a focus about compliance. It's about criminalizing certain actions. So from that perspective, like John said, it's more about Am I committing a crime? Are my employees committing a crimes? What steps do we need to take to prevent that? Yeah. Perfect. So what I, I, I love doing, <laughs> I love plain language, so uh, and I love simplifying things. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go and look at three of the crimes that are in the Cyber Crimes Act, and I would try to simplify in plain language them, because some of them are mind twisters. You, you, you read and you read it and you read it and you think, mm, do I know what this is actually saying? So I've tried to simplify them and that's what I'm gonna show you now what uh, on three of the crimes. And uh, I'm also gonna show and explain to you why I think they are possibly still too broad and why I'm still concerned that many people will unwittingly or unknowingly commit these cyber crimes and end up being criminals. But at the end of it, I'm gonna run a poll to check whether you agree with me. And I'm very much playing devil's advocate here. I'm giving you the argument of why I think many of you are still criminals or gonna be criminals. <laughs> but I'm interested to see at the end if you agree with me. Um, as, as Bronwyn said to me, I, I must make sure that I explain it simply so that uh, <laughs> I can prove that I understand it well enough. All right, so let's, um, share my screen. And so what I did, I, I went to the section in the law. And uh, so on the left hand side, you've got the actual text of the law. And on the right hand side, you've got my plain language summary. So I started with 2-2. Two, two. So I'm not too worried about 2-1. That's really trying to catch somebody 
uh, well, let's leave that one. 2.2 two is the one that I was worried about because it reads any person who unlawfully and intentionally accesses a computer system or a computer data storage medium is guilty of an offense. Now I do that all day, every day. And I think everybody does. Everybody intentionally accesses a computer system. The only question then is, well, is it lawful or not? Well, I think it's mainly lawful, but do I know all the laws that relating to, relate to accessing a computer system? And am I potentially committing this crime? So you then ask yourself, well, what does access mean? And then we go into down here into B, which then says, if you access a computer storage medium, if, if you use data or store data. So now I'm going, wow, sheep as if I use or store data, that's accessing a computer system. I do that all day, every day intentionally. And then B, so uh, sorry, C says that for the purposes of B, so where they're talking about using data, it's if you copy or move data. So if we come across to the right hand side here, I've summarized it now to say that so any person who unlawfully and intentionally accesses a computer system by copying or moving data or storing data is guilty of an offense. Now, that's that's pretty scary because data is any data, um, personal data, but confidential data. It's any data whatsoever. The law does say that POPIA applies not the Cybercrimes Act, which is really good in this context. So that means that POPIA is not criminalized. But the only word really here that saves me is unlawfully, because I intentionally access a computer system by moving data, copying data, storing data. I do that all day. So I then need to know what laws relate to that and make sure I'm not doing anything unlawful because otherwise I'm committing a crime and that worries me that that to me is too broad so then let's look at the next one which is around the unlawful interception of data and again on the the left here is the the section on the right is what what I've summarized so I'm I'm summarizing three one um, I'll leave two and three for the moment and, and two and three, they've also, uh, POPIA applies not the Cybercrimes Act. So POPIA is not criminalized by those two, which relate to the possession of data, which is a good thing because we obviously all possess a lot of data. But this section, if we come across to the right-hand side, my plain language version is any person who unlawfully and intentionally copies non-public data so, and so non-public data to me is confidential data, not personal data, but confidential, but it's not defined in the Cyber Crimes Act. So as to make it available to a person other than the lawful owner or holder, or the sender or recipient of the data is guilty of an offense. So, I, you know, there, I, I think there are quite a few times where I intentionally copy non-public data, so confidential information, and I make it available to somebody else. I mean, if I don't have contractual obligations of confidentiality, then in the normal free flow of information through an information economy, surely often there's non-public data that's being shared and is flowing between different people. So I, I definitely worry here, I think there's a potential for for us to commit crimes. And note here that the Cyber Crimes Act applies not POPIA. So if you, if you did this in the context of data protection as well, it would also be a crime. And then I'm gonna to go to this one here as well, which is number five. And this is to do with the uh, interference of data. Now, this again, the Cyber Crimes Act applies not POPIA. And there's the, the written, the, the law on the right is my plain language version. So any person who unlawfully or intentionally deletes data is guilty of an offense. So that's one, sorry, that should be two, three. So if you do any of these, deletes data, alters data, renders data meaningless, interferes with the lawful use of data, 
denies access to data is guilty of an offense. And the Cyber Crimes Act applies not pop here. So if we just go back here, you'll see this is for the purposes of those sections, not for the purposes of section five. So if you are doing this for pop here, you could be committing a crime as well. So let me give you an example here. So deletes data. So Popia says that you must delete a record or personal information when you no longer need it. But there are many laws that require us to retain records, all the record retention laws. So if I go and intentionally delete data, contrary to a record retention law that's unlawful, I'm therefore guilty of an offense. So that's pretty scary if you ask me. And then also if I unlawfully, so contrary to any law, I alter data, I'm guilty of an offense. We all are denying access to data every day. That's what we do. That's what information security is about, is you want to deny people access. You're restricting access because you, either it's personal information, it's confidential, it's sensitive. There are many different reasons. But if you unlawfully and intentionally deny access to data, you're guilty of an offense. So the, the wording of the act is so much better than it was. The, 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 there, were, there were various drafts and bills along the way that really made us all criminals. I think the, the latest draft is much, much better, but I still think it has the potential for making many of us data criminals. So that's my, my argument for it. And, and I, I want to run quickly this poll for you and let's get an idea if you agree with me um, and see what you think. So if you wouldn't mind answering this poll and let's just get a feel whether you're worried about this or not. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those balancing acts. You want the law, the crimes to be quite broadly defined so we catch the criminals, but at the same time, we don't want the net so broad that we catch a whole lot of people who are not criminals. And it's a very difficult balance to strike. And I think it's a lot better than it used to be, but it still is, in my view, an issue. Um, so let's share the results and see. So most of you do uh, ag agree with me. Um, which is interesting. So I don't know what we do about that <laughs> because the act is an act, it's been signed by the president. It's not gonna be changed, but um, possibly what the answer is is through the courts will be to develop and, and try and uh, interpret what those sections mean. So Lisa, back to you. Thanks very much, John. And you've raised a great points. Um, I know that when we were, cause we've been with the bill right from the beginning when it was the bill and now it's an act. And it was one of the things that was mentioned in Parliament. Should it not, should not just um, the whole chapter two and three, which deals with these crimes, should it not be subject to, or should Poppy not come into play, as opposed to just cherry picking specific crimes where Poppy doesn't apply or we'd follow Poppy. So it's quite interesting that they chose this approach to only pick a few crimes as opposed to the whole section, because the whole section does deal with data. And as someone mentioned in the comments, data is broadly defined, so it can be anything. But I guess, as you mentioned, John, let's see what the courts do. I think the courts don't want to make you and I criminals just for dealing with data in a certain way, or maybe um, unintentionally doing something, but we'll see what happens. Any thoughts from you, Nathan? Oh, yes. Uh... <laughs> I think John was waiting to to show us the the results of his argument, and it was really great. Thank you very much, John. And I think Bronwyn will, will agree as well that he explained it simply and in easy, understandable language. Um, but yeah, I agree that we're going to have to wait on on the courts. I mean, we also need to consider the fact that the act won't be interpreted on its own. There are different aspects of the act which will be interpreted with other acts. So, for example, the Criminal Procedure Act. Um, when it comes to certain crimes, it will also be interpreted with um, ECTA, or the Electronic Communications and the Transactions Act, as well as POPIA. And uh, I hope that the, the approach the courts take and possibly the information regulator as well, if they, they decide to release any guidance notes about, about this, will we'll take the approach that uh, 
we, they need to follow, follow the spirit of the law, which is to to essentially catch criminals who are actually causing uh, significant harm to people. And uh, then the second point is just that South Africa isn't the only country that's battling with how to regulate cyber crimes. It, it is an international issue, and the the general international approach is uh, to trial and error. So uh, we where they put out a piece of legislation they they've sent this out for commentary as lisa has mentioned the bill's been here for years uh, but ultimately we're going to have to wait on on um, on their decision but that doesn't mean that organizations and, and uh, whether you are private or public can't take steps to prevent um the, the major issues and cyber crimes from taking place, and also just to create awareness um, with within your organization and how you manage data generally. And some of the principles in pop here will help, and we'll go through some of those. Um, of, of well, we will go through some of those information security elements later. But the important point is that uh, we need to take a proactive approach to cyber crimes. Yeah, Nathan, maybe just to pick up on that, I agree with you. If, if the cyber crimes bill makes doing certain things with data and computers unlawful, well, if it's, it, you, it's a crime, if you, if you deal with them unlawfully, you need to know the law. <laughs> so it becomes really important that you know all laws, all data laws, all IT laws, all laws that could relate to a computer system, and make sure that you're on the right side of those laws. Because if you are not in accordance with those laws, then the crime comes into play. If you're in accordance with the law, then you're okay. To play devil's advocate, John, how am I supposed to know all the laws? Do you know what I mean? Um, it's different for us. We are attorneys. We can find them. But the common man does not have time to look for laws. How are they going to answer to that? Yeah, Lisa, it's a great question. I don't know that I know all the laws either. <laughs> Considering it's all laws, it's 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 legislation, it's um, it's common law, it's judgments. It's a really really broad topic. Um, the one way I'd say is that we've developed a list of IT laws in South Africa, which is a document we update frequently. And the purpose of that document is simply to give you a list of all IT laws that exist in South Africa. So that would be one way. Thanks, John. Bronwyn, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, thanks, Lisa. I think now would be a good time for a couple of questions. Um, we've had quite a few coming through that relate to what we've already discussed. I think first and foremost would be we've had questions relating to do you have an example of how someone might be accessing data unlawfully in their day to day work without knowing? So just sort of giving examples of what we might be doing already that would be regarded as unlawful. Um, we've just touched on now the fact that, you know, knowing all the laws and knowing what would be unlawful is quite a challenge, but can you think of any examples top of head? Uh, sorry, that, that's, that is a great question. And um, I mean, so if, if the law is saying you accessing a computer system unlawfully, so you might not be aware that, um, there's a municipal law that says you can't access um, a property owner's register um, or that that certain information is confidential. And you then access that law not knowing that, that it's actually confidential information. Or, um, I mean, the more obvious ones are, are that you, you don't know that certain information has been restricted. And this is where the protection of state's information act or bill comes into play maybe maybe it's been restricted as, as top secret and you don't know that and you access that information and you store it you move it you do something with it would be too off the top of my head yeah bron uh, as well just on that question what becomes so vital now as well is how um, organizations will enter into agreements with companies so for example they they want to make sure that they have the right warranties and indemnities that the information they get is lawful as well because uh, in that way they protect themselves that um, we're in an, in an instance where they may be getting data from somewhere else Thanks very much, Nathan and John, for answering that question. Um, I think a follow-up question to that is, um, 
can juristic persons be committing these crimes unlawfully? So if it was sort of in the in the employee context and an employee is working under instruction um, of their company and in that sense commits a, a cybercrime, would the, the liability shift to the juristic person or would it just be uh, the employee that would be responsible? And we've also got someone who asked, um, to what extent would the act apply to e-commerce businesses such as Uber and Amazon? So if we could touch on that a bit, perhaps. Um, I can just hop in on the second question about the jurisdiction. So something that um, is important to note about this act is that the crime does not have to happen in South Africa. If it happens to a South African citizen and it's and the perpetrator is outside of South Africa, then our courts do have jurisdiction. So that's quite an interesting part of the law. And this law specifically is that it has a wide scope. Um, simply because when we think about it, data and computers and technology, we are accessing data from anywhere in the world. Whether we're watching a movie, it might be hosted somewhere else. It's not within South Africa. So that's the intention of making sure that the um, act has quite a big scope. So let's say an employee of Uber does something to us, um, commits a cybercrime against us. We would be able to prosecute them even if they're not in South Africa. So it's just important to note that fact. I see, John, your hands up. Yes, just to answer the first components of that is that a person is defined as any natural or juristic person. And the crimes are all phrased any person who unlawfully and intentionally. So it would always be a question of fact as to who actually committed the crime, who, who did the thing. Um, and it could be the individual or the organization. But I think that where data protection law is often more focused on an organization or the responsible party and holding the body responsible, Cyber Crimes Act is more in terms of holding an individual accountable. And so I think it, it would typically be towards the, the individual rather than the company. Okay, thanks Bronwyn. Do we have any other questions or can we go on to some of the other buckets. I think continuing some of the other buckets, we do have lots of questions, but it might be worth holding them over in case we touch on the answers in the rest of the webinar. Okay, thanks so much, Bronwyn. So as we mentioned, we've looked at the, um, looked at how private organizations are affected. We've talked a little bit about Popia and the Cyber Crimes Act from a data, a personal data perspective. But just to piggyback off of that, we have discussed that there is a bit of an impact and interaction between um, the Cyber Crimes Act and Papia and different aspects like information security and things like that. So there is quite a bit of interaction between this law and different kinds of laws. And I don't know, Nathan, if you want to just touch on those aspects and some key examples, if you may have some. Awesome, thank you very much, Lisa. Yes, so transnet has been on everyone's um, lips at the moment because of what has happened with them but in in brief they they experienced a, a data breach where someone had unlawfully unlawfully the keyword accessed <laughs> their system and as a result of that uh, they um, responded by uh, oh, because of the, the cybercrime that took place, they um, had to stop some of their functionality. And so what they did is they issued a, a letter to their customers, um, essentially evoking a clause in their contract called a force majeure clause. And this clause says that um, something has happened beyond their control and as a result, they can't perform under their agreements. So, but, uh, well, that's the story in a nutshell, but when it comes to, a, a, from a cyber crimes perspective, the, the crime would be hacking and the focus would be on whoever hacked the system. But when it comes to how um, the, the continuity of businesses and how they manage incidents like that, the first important point that I need to drive home is that cyber crimes act or cyber crimes um, in general are going to become more prevalent. Uh, it's, it's just like data breaches, you can expect it to happen. It, organizations around the world are, are reporting on this continuously. 
And so the only thing that you can really do, which brings me to my second point, is that you need to prepare. Um, it's like preparing for war. Uh, you need to have certain uh, information security standards in place. And these are, are um, you can follow local or international standards like the ISO standards or NIST or SOC, which those are some of the standards out there. But they essentially lay down um, various protocols that you need to follow within your organization such as using encryption on your data managing access who has access to um, data that you may hold on any of your devices and uh, the the last point is managing contracts so ensuring that any data source that you're getting is is coming from a reputable source not buying databases from a random company internationally it becomes so much more important to do due diligence on companies and and, and data sources generally so uh, in a nutshell uh how organizations approach the the it governance general generally needs to consider uh the cyber crimes act as as one of the key considerations Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Nathan. So what I'm hearing you say is that I need to look at other laws and other acts when it comes to information security. It doesn't derive from the Cyber Crimes Act. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, in, there isn't a general information security law in South Africa, uh, but the uh, PAPIA, the PAPI Act, does uh, specify certain information security, uh, well, that uh, parties have to have security measures in place when they process personal information. But uh, because the Cyber Crimes Act is so broad, uh, as mentioned earlier, and defines data so broadly, those information security uh, standards may need to apply to other types of information as well. So, for example, confidential information, proprietary information that has value, and as John mentioned, certain um, uh, information that may be um, redacted um, for, for state reasons. Um, I don't know if you just want to add to that, John. Yes, just to, to mention that the Cyber Crimes Act was at a point, or actually for a long time, known as the Cyber Crimes and Cyber Security Bill. And that caused a lot of confusion because many people felt or, or thought that that bill then required them to put cyber security in place to have information security. And um, it's not the Cyber Crimes Act that requires, so the, the cyber security component was removed from the name and it's just the Cyber Crimes Act. And, and that, that's another whole story about state security. But um, really, the important thing to remember is that the Cyber Crimes Act doesn't require you to have information security. It's POPIA that requires you to secure personal data. Great, thank you very much, John. So we've looked at two key issues now. We've looked at the interaction between POPIA and data and cyber crimes. We've also discussed a little bit about information security and cyber crimes. What other impacts, John, does cyber, the Cyber Crimes have, Act have on private organizations that we haven't discussed already? Sorry, I lost my mute button there for a second. Um, so I think we, we're going to go into more specific examples of the impact on specific people like financial institutions. But I think um, broadly for private organizations, the, the sorts of things is that there's a crime relating to the use of different tools that might be used to commit cyber crimes. And I think many of us use those tools for legitimate purposes as well. And we need to be careful about what we're doing with those tools and we don't commit crimes in that context. And then we, and I, I'm, I'm, as I said, I very much believe in the rule of law. We want to catch criminals in South Africa and all of us are gonna have a role to play in helping law enforcement to catch criminals because I've seen many comments talking and saying, well, who's gonna enforce this law? Is it gonna be the South African Police Service? Are SAPs in, uh, able to enforce it and actually catch these criminals? We can talk more about that and the mechanisms that have been created and introduced to try and catch people. But I think we all have a role to play in helping law enforcement. And I think that that's very important. We, we need to plan that we might have to preserve evidence. We might need to um, obtain evidence and hand it over to law enforcement. We very much have a role to play in assisting law enforcement to maintain law and order in South Africa. 
Great, thanks very much, John. Nathan, do you have anything to add or can we move on to the next bucket? Oh yeah, just something quick. I, it becomes so important. Um, I think one of our colleagues mentioned this to, to classify data um, and also to use software to, to manage how, how your organization um, processes data because if something goes wrong or an incident arises, it, it helps to have an easy and, and uh, easy way to have a view of what's going on in your organization when it comes to data and how you manage it effectively. Thanks very much, Nathan. So what I want to quickly do is we've discuss some practical impacts on private organizations. I just want to run a quick poll to see what you feel is important from a, a private organization perspective and what you're worried about. So let me just launch the poll and give you a few minutes just to um, answer. And once again, if you have any other worries related to you um, from a private organization perspective, please let us know and just specify in the chat. So Lisa, some of the actions I think um, that, that, that organizations should really take is, in addition to what we've mentioned, would be to do an awareness campaign amongst the employees in your organizations, explaining what crimes are and what they aren't. And I, for me, this is one of the big criticisms still of the Cyber Crimes Act is that we just looked at some of those crimes. And honestly, I've read them five times and I'm still not sure I understand what the crime is. Now, if you're gonna be putting somebody in jail for five years, surely parliament should be accurately describing what you can't do so that people know what they can't do. So I think there still needs to be a lot of work in, in, in making the crimes easily understandable and giving lots of practical examples and making sure because we don't want our employees committing crimes. So we need to uh, explain to them what it is that they must do so they don't commit those crimes. That's a great point, John. So I'll just share the results. And really, a lot of you are concerned about how the Cyber Crimes Act will affect your general compliance and that makes sense. But once again, the interplay between your general uh, compliance, we need to think about the fact that this is more of a criminal law as opposed to a compliance-based law. Um, there are some concerns about whether the law criminali criminalizes non-compliance with POPIA. Um, some of you are concerned about everything, who goes to jail, whether it's just an additional cost to your organization, how long it's gonna take you to align with the law. So these are concerns we're definitely aware of. And that makes sense from a, from a uh, private organization perspective. So the next um, bucket that we want to look at is financial institutions. So financial institutions are, of course, are a subset of private organizations. But the reason we want to highlight them is because the act has very specific requirements for financial institutions. In fact, it requires financial institutions to actually um, report crimes within 72 hours to the police. And also it requires them to pre preserve any data in order to assist um, the police. As John mentioned, assistance is something that's gonna be quite important going forward because of this act. So from that perspective, does anyone else have any other practical implications that they can think of when it comes to financial institutions? I think for me, the, the, the biggie here is that incident response becomes even more important. So we know that under uh, data protection law, you've got to respond to an incident. And if you have a breach, you need to notify different people. Financial institutions now also need to, to be aware that where there's an incident which is not a breach, but there was a crime involved, they now need to be reporting this to the South African police services and start preserving evidence that is, is, is available. Oh, sorry, any evidence that relates to that crime and, uh, and, and it's at their cost that they need to do it and then make that available to law enforcement. And that's a significant undertaking. If you take a bank, there are cyber criminals trying to commit cyber crimes against a bank and the, its, its customers all day, every day. 
So from a practical perspective, how is that financial institution now going to start being aware of them? You've got to know about them. Then you've got to gather evidence around them and report it to law enforcement. That's a significant impact. And unpacking that and really considering and thinking about how you're going to do that practically is, a, is something you need to start thinking about very quickly. Yeah, and that almost goes back to your point about awareness. So let's say there is an incident from a data protection perspective, but you're not aware that it's also a crime and you've only just reported to the information regulator. You still need to report to the police because if you don't, you yourself could be, or your organization could be committing a crime and you could be fined uh, 50,000 Rand for that. So you don't wanna be in that position. And I think the trickiest part about this is also, as we mentioned, you have to preserve evidence or preserve data. How long do I have to preserve it for? Is it indefinite? That's not really described in the law at this, uh, at this point. So what if a huge, like John mentioned, if we take a bank, for example, if a huge breach happened, that's also a crime, am I just uh, preserving this data in a data center? How long do I keep it? Is that an additional cost to my organization? Those are certain things that you have to think about from a practical perspective of how to really manage a crime and when you're doing the preservation of data. So it really is tricky and something that financial institutions, and we'll mention it a bit later, electronic communication service providers also have to think about. Nathan, do you have any points to add? Yeah, look, I actually feel really sorry for businesses in South Africa at the moment, because they, beyond what's happening internationally and with the economy as well, there has been an influx of, of laws at the moment and uh, the, it's, it is difficult to navigate everything. And this, this difficulty doesn't only apply to, to ordinary organizations, it applies to lawyers as well. There's a, there's a lot going on and there's a lot to interpret within a short period of time. But getting things, I think the, the first step is not so much to focus on how can I not, how, can, how can, am I a cyber criminal and how can I not become a cyber criminal, but rather focus on how can I not perform conduct that would be unlawful, which would create a crime? Uh, so what are the basic measures that I need to have in place from a from an access to information point of view, from a PAPIA point of view? Um, am I complying with those laws effectively? And start there. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's easier said than done, but if, if you focus on the criminal aspect, you'll in, ignore the, the intention behind the legislature with the um, with the Cyber Crimes Act. Uh, from my perspective, and, and there may be differing opinions, certain crimes are in place because of incidents that have happened. So hacking has, or unethical hacking has taken place. There have been incidents where people have, have uh, experienced significant harm. And, and, and that's why we have criminal law in, in, in place. It's to, it's a, a retributive form of justice to, to correct behavior. And, the, the act's intention is to, to, to um, create a mechanism to solve those issues. It may un unintentionally go beyond that because as, as we've mentioned before, data is very difficult to understand and manage. So it, 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 will, it is a trial um, or case by case basis. But the, the best approach is to get compliance right when it comes to other laws and then consider how the impact, how, how it impacts the Cyber Crimes Act um, within your organization. That's a great point, Nathan, thanks very much. And similarly with private organizations, I'm going to run a quick poll, just to uh, look at what you're worried about from a financial institution perspective, if you are one. So I've just launched it. We're gonna give it a few uh, seconds and then we will um, share the results. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results. And as expected, the biggest concern is definitely uh, reputational damage, which makes sense because as we've seen when there's been different hacks and those will be crimes, they're obviously damaged to the reputation of that organization and we don't want to be in that position. 
Um, of course, as well, whether we're committing a crime or if we're going to go to jail or get fined is a big concern as well and losing customers. So this is definitely something that we uh, have to consider when we're a financial institution. Um, Bronwyn, should we answer some questions related to that? Sorry, Lisa, there's, there's many questions coming in. Can you just repeat um, the context? Are, are there any questions related to financial institutions that we just discussed? Not that I'm catching. Um, I think quite a few relating to reporting crimes that you've detected and whether you've got that responsibility to report, but I think we've already touched on that um, in okay. the previous uh, bucket. Okay, great. And I just want to point out that the obligation in terms of the law and specifically the cyber crimes law is on two specific bodies, the uh, financial institutions and what we call electronic communications and services providers. So that's the next bucket that we're going to look at that and IT company. So that specific requirement obligation, which attaches a crime if you don't do it, is only for those two people. However, as John mentioned, because this law is in effect, we have to make sure that if there is a crime, even if we don't have that legal obligation, we should still consider reporting because a crime has been committed. So it's just important to just note that from that perspective. So as I mentioned, um, we have something called electronic communications and services providers. So the act really defines us quite broadly, but when we think about typical examples, it really is um, organizations like network operators, ISPs, and possibly IT service providers and vendors. So once again, they do have the same obligations as financial institutions, but there might be some additional ones that we should look out for if we are a ISP or an ICT company. John, do you have any specific things that we've mentioned, maybe specific crimes that internet um, ICT companies need to think about from a practical perspective? Yes, sure. I think uh, ICT companies, they, they often provide software or hardware tools to organizations. That's what they're in the business of. That's what they, they sell. And if it becomes now a crime, if, if a person unlawfully and intentionally uses one of those tools to commit a cyber crime, potentially the ICT company can be aiding and abetting a criminal to commit a crime. So it would be to, to do an assessment of every, all your offerings um, and to see to what extent they could be used to commit crimes and to see if that raises any risks for you. I think that would be an important um, impact. John, to play devil's advocate, a computer can be used to commit a crime. A cell phone can be used to commit a crime. So am I supposed to stop running my business? Yeah, no, <laughs> I know that's, <clears throat> that's a good point. But if you think of a tool like um, a, a tool that enables white hat hacking or penetration testing, the purpose of the tool is to try and check that you've got good security measures in place, but somebody, a criminal could also use that tool to hack a system. So there is where, where there, it's more in those sort of scenarios where there are gray areas where a tool can be used for good or bad purposes. That's where you need to be more careful. Definitely. And I think that that's where it ties into the fact that this is where the courts are gonna to have to develop the law and interpret what this means, because they cannot go after you and I who are just using our computers that happen to be considered tools that one can use to commit crimes. Nathan, I see your hands up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is also has a really big impact on social media generally. Uh, uh, specifically, if someone shares someone else's data or intimate images of them online and with well without their consent, that that would be unlawful. And so, in that instance, the there is an obligation on the media platforms or social media platforms to um, take down certain things. Um, how that will actually work out in practice is is a completely different situation because, uh, as we know, it's very difficult to get. Um, big social media companies to, to remove posts. But um, yeah, it's, it's important to keep that in mind and as well as em employee behavior when it comes to posting things on social media that may relate to a company. Um, so yeah, that, that, all of that becomes relevant. Great, thanks very much, Nathan. I just wanna run our poll on um, 
the worries that maybe ICT companies and ECSPs might have. So I've just launched it. And Nathan, you're actually leading on to our next point. When we're thinking about the impact of data of the Cyber Crimes Act on us as individuals. So we'll just let the poll, um, I've kept it up. And once we get the results, we'll just discuss them quickly and then look at the perspective of individuals. I think while we're waiting people to vote, I, I see there are lots of questions coming in and um, there are lots of good questions. We, we're, uh, we're not going to have time to manage all of these questions during this session, but we will look at all the questions you've sent us and try and answer them either through our website or through different means. I think now that this is an act, many of us are, are really engaging with it in, in a lot more detail to say, okay, now what do we do? We, we've, we've over the years have engaged with various drafts at many different uh, instances, but now it's an act, it's really a case of saying, we're waiting for this commencement date, what do we need to do? And, and we'll be working on that and we'll provide you a lot more guidance in the future on it. That's true, thanks, John. And I see from the results that essentially most people from an ICT company perspective are worried about everything. Who's responsible for crimes committed once again, the additional costs of compliance, um, whether you can still operate your business and how long do you need to preserve evidence for. So those are definite uh, big concerns and we can understand how that can affect you and maybe be a worry. So I'll just stop sharing and quickly just discuss the impact of the law on us as individuals. So we have definitely been looking at it from a business perspective, but also we are normal people and we use computers, as I mentioned, and other technology as, as the daily part of our lives. It's almost impossible to communicate or do anything work-related without technology. So there is an impact on us as humans. And of course, we all are probably on some level of social media, whether it's WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram or Facebook, we're constantly communicating and sharing messages. So when we think about um, our own, from our own perspective locally, of course, in the recent un unrest in the, com uh, in the country, there's been quite a bit of misinformation and different things have been shared in social media. So John, will I be a criminal if I simply just share this information or any information with somebody else online? Yeah, so the, the law introduces the concept of a malicious communication. And um, let me, if you just give me a second here, um, let me share my screen quickly and show you what uh, the plain language version again of what the, the law is saying. Um, so the law is saying that it is a crime to send out a data mes message which incites damage to property or violence that threatens people with damage to property or violence, or that discloses an intimate image of somebody without their consent. And I think, yeah, Lisa, you're right, based on the, the unrest we've had in South Africa, those top two there, I think there are lots of people who sent malicious, malicious communications on Twitter, on WhatsApp, and certainly many, many people committed a cybercrime over the last three weeks. And um, I think this is gonna have a significant impact in uh, in south africa john just on, on that okay. point okay. Oh, sorry lisa uh, john just on that point sorry, uh, go. <laughs> uh, yeah i just wanted to check so uh playing devil's advocate lisa's usual role uh what uh, what impact do you think that this will have on the media because sometimes a journalist well often journalists have to share recordings of 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 these um types of data on um, news publications and articles on um on television what do you think about that yeah, so the, the impact on the media is interesting. It's it's the the uh, you know the, there's for data protection there's the exemption for media companies, and where it's for journalistic purposes, and then you have the press code which really relates to confidentiality and privacy, but for media companies in terms of 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 how they get stories and what information they access like non-public data. I think there's a serious risk of media companies committing various cyber crimes. And I think they need to be very careful because it could be a way to censor the, the media is to argue that they've committed a cyber crime. And 
also, yeah, I think the media needs to be careful that they're not spreading malicious communications as well. And it did occur to me with many of the, the TV channels which were showing people looting, were they encouraging more looting by showing those images? And it was actually interesting that after a while, the well, TV channels I was watching changed their tune pretty quickly and stopped showing images of looting and rather balanced it with law enforcement and other things. And I think they realized at a point that they might be flaming, uh, fanning the flames and therefore had to change what they were covering. That's a great point, John. Um, especially when we just think about the act. As far as we know, there's almost very few, if no, um, defenses. I don't believe that there is a public interest defense from the last time I looked at the act, which is quite concerning. Um, because of course, sometimes, as you mentioned, it's part of media's job to give us information and that information might be the type of information that incites certain things, but it is for our information benefit. So that will be interesting to see what the courts do from that perspective, especially should a media house, for example, um, commit a cyber crime. So that is looking at it from an individual's perspective. One thing that I just want to do quickly, um, since we're running a bit out of time, is just to launch a poll about what you're interested in from a Michelson's perspective and how we can possibly help you. So there are various different ways that um, we can assist you. As John mentioned, if people are interested in training and training their employees, that might be a way to assist from a, from a cyber crimes perspective. So there are various different options and you can choose the one that applies to you. And yeah, I've just launched the poll and I'll give it a few minutes and then we can look at the results. Now, Lisa, I think we, we you know, as Michelsons, we, we believe in the rule of law. We want to play a role in protecting people from criminals. We want to help prosecute criminals and, and have, make sure there are consequences so that they're in jail. Um, but we also want to help organizations to make sure that they, they don't commit cyber crimes. And we, we, we're keen to help, and this is going to be another developing area of law that's going to, to have a significant impact for a long period of time. So it's really useful to know how, what sort of assistance you're looking for, what would you like us to help you with? And so either through this poll, or you can pop it in the chat, or send us an email, what, how would, what help are you looking for? What do you need relating to the Cyber Crimes Act, and we'll do our best to help you. Great, thanks, John. So I'm ending the poll and I will share the results. From what we're seeing is that majority of you are quite interested in a level of training, uh, private training in terms of this act, which is understandable. As some of you mentioned in the comments in the chat is that it is quite a hard act to understand. Even John, as he said, we've, I'm sure we've read this bill so many times and this act so many times, every iteration. And Someone even mentioned in the chat, each time somebody else will have a different um, interpretation as to it. So it really is important to unpack it so you can understand whether um, you're committing a crime and have that level of awareness. Um, people are interested in opinions on the Cyber Crimes Act, which makes sense as well. And some of you are interested in a cyber crimes program in whatever iteration that would be. So it's really good to understand that there is um, some interest in how we can assist you. And as John mentioned, in due process, we'll be able to do that. So I'll stop sharing the results. And really, thanks very much for everyone for attending this. This was quite a, a you can see it's quite a topical session. We received quite a lot of questions about um, how the Cyber Crimes Act interacts with you as a person as a different types of organizations and just in general curiosity about this act. And you'll see that as John mentioned, it, it will be something that we'll discuss more and more as it becomes more topical and as more crimes might be committed and we want to see how the law will actually be put into effect. So um, thanks everyone, thanks panel, thanks John, thanks Bronwyn, thanks Nathan, since we've run out of time. Um, but I hope you all had a good, uh, this was a helpful session to you and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.
Yes, thanks very much. And we, we've taken notes of the questions you've asked. And sorry if we haven't answered them. We will try and answer that through our website or through different channels. But thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye.